Hello, my name is Gail Dewald. I'm a member of a and A's Alamo City Chapter and the current chair of the Leadership Development Committee. With me, I have my better half, John Dewald. John has spent his career in investment strategy and planning and joins us today to help us understand the ins and outs of investments for nonprofit organizations such as a and n a Our learning objectives today are to define investment, asset allocation, rebalancing and risk tolerance, describe the different classes of assets and their importance to the to an organization, and to explain the legal environment for a nonprofit investment. John, I will turn it over to you to start us out. Thanks, Gail. An investment is an asset purchased with the idea that the asset will increase in value to provide future income or be sold at a higher price. Most investments are made with the intended outcome of providing an income stream or the expectation that its value will appreciate in the future. When we purchase something, it may or may not be a good investment, correct? That's right, Gail. That brings us to risk tolerance, which is the degree of variability in investment returns that an individual or a group in ANNA's case is willing to withstand. Risk tolerance is an important component in investing. It's very important to know how much risk you're willing to accept. One should have a realistic understanding of his or her ability and willingness to stomach large swings in the value of the investments. Investors who take on too much risk may panic and sell at the wrong time. Let's think of it as the sleep at night factor. Can you give us an example of an investment that has high risk and one with low risk? A high risk investment might be a stock in a new company with no track record while a low-risk investment could be a short-term U.S. government bond. There are different classes of assets. Cash is one. It is a non-invested asset waiting to be used for a future investment. Then there are equities. They include all types of stocks, such as Toyota, General Electric, and Novartis, to name a few. We usually think of investments as stocks and bonds, but in today's world, it is more complicated. Stocks or equities include U.S. companies, international companies, emerging markets, and frontier markets. The U.S. accounts for about 35% of the world's stock market. Developed countries with stocks are part of the international stock market and make up 42% of the entire stock market, while 23% of stocks are in the frontier and emerging markets. Are emerging market and frontier market stocks riskier? They certainly can be. The markets are less developed, often less regulated, and transactions are done in the local currency, which adds exchange rate risk for a U.S. investor. Fixed income or bonds are another class of assets. U.S. government or sovereign bonds of developed countries are considered the safest. Next highest in safety is high-grade corporate bonds. High-yield bonds are issued by lesser quality companies where the risk of default is higher. Just as stocks, you can invest in emerging market bonds. As a whole, would you say bonds are less risky for loss of investment over stocks? In most cases, bonds are considered less risky, but they are not without risk, especially bonds with long maturities, 20 to 30 years, and of course bonds issued by companies with low or no credit ratings. There are also alternative assets, which simply are alternatives to stocks and bonds. A few examples are hedge funds, managed futures, real estate, and commodities. A conservative portfolio would likely have no more than 10% invested in alternative assets. Is the important takeaway about investing in different classes of assets about having a balance of assets that create enough risk to build a portfolio but allowing one to sleep at night? I think you've summed it up quite nicely. What you're alluding to is asset allocation. Asset allocation is an investment portfolio technique that aims to balance risk and create diversification by dividing assets among major categories such as cash, bonds, stocks, real estate, and derivatives. The asset allocation process involves deciding what percent of your portfolio will be invested in each asset class. While one class is underperforming, the other may be overperforming, resulting in a more balanced overall portfolio return. Remember the case of Enron. 
Quite a few Enron employees had their entire retirement portfolio with Enron stock. When the company defaulted, their portfolios were totally wiped out. You should always have a diverse portfolio. Would a portfolio with 40% stocks, 40% bonds, 10% cash, and 10% alternatives be too risky for a nonprofit? If so, why? Not necessarily too risky. Your organization should have an investment policy statement that clearly states the range of exposure to each asset class, allowing the investment manager's room to adjust allocation depending on market conditions and outlook. Rebalancing is the process of realigning the weightings of the portfolio of assets. It involves periodically buying or selling assets in the portfolio to maintain the original desired level of asset allocation. At regular intervals, at least annually, you should review asset class balances and adjust to maintain your intended asset allocation. Here's an example. If you are 50-50 stocks and bonds, and stocks go up 10%, while bonds go down 10%, you end up underinvested in bonds and overinvested in stocks. In this situation, are you saying you might sell some stocks and invest that money into bonds to rebalance the assets? Yes, you've got that right. That's exactly how the rebalancing process works. Some nonprofits practice social responsible investing. They focus on avoiding certain industries regardless of opportunity for financial gain. Philip Morris, now known as Altria, a tobacco industry giant, has been a great investment performer, but the American Cancer Society probably does not own their stock. So what I think you are saying is that the organization's mission should align with the types of stocks that are within their portfolio. Is that correct? Very much so, and that should be part of the written investment policy statement. What if the investments do not perform well? Who is liable? Good question. It's a legal issue. Case law dating back almost 200 years holds that if you act in a prudent manner, you are okay. It is called the Prudent Man Rule of 1830. There are modern day laws that now add clarity to the Prudent Man Rule. If you make decisions that any prudent person was likely to make, given the information available at the time, then there is no liability. Most nonprofit organizations use the services of a consulting group to help them manage their funds. These groups will establish asset allocation, make investment selections, buy and sell investments, maintain custody of the assets, and report performance to the board of directors. This is usually done on a quarterly basis to provide transparency and communication. Investment goals for most nonprofits are these. To remain solvent as an organization, to serve the membership, and to provide funds for future need. We want to thank you for listening and hope that you have gained some insight into how investments are made in a nonprofit organization. This slideshow contains only basic concepts and is not expected to be providing direction on personal investing. Thank you again for listening to our program and have a great day.